We're in Hebrews chapter 7. If you want to open up there, and we've been looking at Jesus as the priest after the order of Melchizedek, showing how Jesus is a superior priest to the Levitical priests of the Old Testament law. Hence, the teaching of the author here, don't go back to the law, it's inferior. Stick with Christ, you're in a superior position with this great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we've, we're looking at Melchizedek last week a bit, and uh, I think we were on verse 4, weren't we? We concluded there? Or were we past that? We were at 10. Okay. Really? No, I don't think we did the tithes, did we? Did we do the paying of tithes last week? Okay, let, let's take a look here. Um, see how great he is, namely Melchizedek. Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tithe of the spoils. Remember when Abraham went and rescued Lot, his nephew, from the kings who had captured him. And then he comes back and Melchizedek meets him on the way back from the slaughter of the kings and the rescuing of his nephew Lot. And Abraham actually gave him a tithe of the spoils. Melchizedek being priest of the Most High God, his name by translation, being king of righteousness. He was king of Salem also, which means he's the king of peace, king of righteousness and peace. Hence, a type, a shadow, a preview of Jesus Christ. So Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tithe of the spoils. You already have a question? Did yours say tithe? Mine says tithe. What's yours say? Oh, okay. Well, it's the same thing, but a tenth. Yeah, mine says tithe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brethren, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who has not their genealogy, namely Melchizedek, right, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Here, tithes are received by mortal men, there by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So, how can we compare Melchizedek to the Levitical priests? Superior in every way. Let's look at the ways. He's even superior to Abraham from whom Levi comes. And that's kind of an amazing statement considering that Abraham, you know, we think he's the best. I mean, he's the father of the faithful. The one from whom will come the Christ and out of his loins shall come descendants as the stars and as the sand of the sea and all nations shall be blessed through his offspring, namely Christ. And yet somehow Melchizedek is held up here as even above Abraham. How so? In two ways. What are the two ways in which he shows his superiority or Abraham shows Melchizedek's superiority? Number one, he gives tithes. So you give tithes to the greater, not to the lesser. You have, uh, that's why we give tithes to God in the kingdom of God. If you go with the principle of the tithe. We're not under the law, so we don't command a tithe like in the Old Testament. You're free. God loves a cheerful giver. Give what you can give cheerfully is our rule. However, the tithe is, the right, is a great principle. There's nothing wrong with it. One-tenth, and even more than that would be even better, wouldn't it? Uh, remember Pharaoh in the days of Joseph got 20% Right? Didn't he get 20%? All would go to Pharaoh, except for the, the priests who had their own land uh, during the days of the famine. And so uh, he's, uh, first of all, superior in the tithing. For those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment of the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brethren. 
though these also are descended from Abraham, but this man who has not their genealogy, not meaning that he's like somehow poofed into, you know, into the creation without a father or mother, but means his genealogy is not recorded for us as it's recorded of the Levitical priests and the Aaron, uh, according to the line of Aaron. Uh, he doesn't have their genealogy, but he received tithes from Abraham. So that shows his superiority to Abraham, which the point here is that Christ is superior to the Levitical priests because he is in the order of Melchizedek. So he's superior to the Levitical priests. And then he also says, and Abraham, ble and he blessed him who had the promises. Who had the promises? Abraham had the promises. Who blessed Abraham? Melchizedek. Now, who's superior? The one who blesses, the one who gets blessed. The one who blesses, right? Because the superior always blesses the inferior. You don't have inferior people blessing the superior. It's always the superior that blesses the inferior. Interestingly enough, thinking about that off the top of my head, wasn't it uh, um, Jacob that blessed Pharaoh? Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Showing his superiority not only in age, because Pharaoh recognized, he's like, how old are you? Man, you're ancient. Forget how old he was at the time, like 148 or something, or whatever, somewhere around there, ancient. And he says, my days have not even achieved the days of my fathers. <laughs> Pharaoh's like, wow, you got longevity in your family. Uh, but he blessed Pharaoh. And, but anyway, the superior blesses the inferior, not the other way around. So parents bless children, or pastor in this case, I would bless you because of the position of authority that has been given me as a pastor. In the other sense, we're all equal because we're all just brothers and sisters in Christ, but according to the office of the pastor. Uh, parents bless children, husbands bless their wives, uh, etc. So Melchizedek blesses Abraham, he's superior is the point. And that's the whole point of this passage, the whole point of this, this whole chapter is, is that Melchizedek is even superior to Abraham, therefore Christ is superior to the Levitical, to the, to the Levitical priests. Rrr, practice my enunciation. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Now check this out. Here tithes are received by mortal men, thereby one of whom has testified that he lives. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? Because it's almost like Melchizedek is an immortal somehow in this world. I mean, that's a possible translation, but I would take it to be because his genealogy is not recorded, uh, his, his priesthood, therefore, is never signified in Scripture as ever having ended. And he continues forever, therefore, according to what has been recorded in Scripture, forever. Doesn't mean he's just an immortal in the world, although that's a possible, but I mean, that somehow by that, it doesn't make sense to me. Rather, that he, uh, he lives. Uh, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? Isn't it? So Levi even gave tithes to Melchizedek. How? Because he was still in his loins, in the seed of his genesis, or his... Uh, his his ancestry, but in the loins of Abraham, namely in the seed of his, I can't even think of the word, our procreative part of our body. Genitals, Genitals I couldn't think of that. Yeah. It's a good thing a pastor can't think of that word, actually, I guess, maybe, but um, doctor would. Doctor, you should know that word. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, I don't know why I couldn't think of it. I knew it was like Genesis, and I couldn't think of it at the moment. But um, yes, so... Levi is even waiting already, though not yet born, because his, this, he is in the seed of Abraham. Therefore, even when Abraham gave tithes, Levi, in a sense, was giving tithes. Isn't that something? Showing that, indeed, uh, Melchizedek's superior. I think I said something like that to Naomi once. I'm like, I sailed, but in one sense, you were sort of with me because you were in my loins. And she was like, that's sick. <laughs> it's like, that's, something, that's weird. <laughs> I was like, okay, I've been memorizing Hebrews too much. <laughs> okay, don't use that illustration again with your daughter. <laughs> okay, going on to verse 11. 
and now if perfection had been attainable through, Levi through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Let's just stop there for a moment. If perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, then why do we need another one after, uh, another priest to, order, to rise after the order of Melchizedek? Why did we need a priest after the order of Melchizedek, according to Scripture? Because Psalm 110 says there will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the Son of God. So he's saying that there is going to come one, but why do we need that? Why would we need another priest if everything could be obtained that we need through the law? It can't. The law cannot make perfect. It can't deliver on what you need in terms of salvation, eternal life, and obtaining the kingdom of God, heaven, and the world to come. It can command you what you need to do, namely perfection, but it can't give you any power to do or keep those things, but rather what the law does is only condemn you. Therefore, as we're going to see in the next chapter, there's a fault in the law. Not that the law has any imperfections to it. It's a perfect law, but the fault lies with us. And the fault in the law is that it doesn't have the power to make you perfect, only to command perfection. And so, uh, because the law can't make you perfect, that's why we need another priest and another line after the order of Melchizedek to do what the law could not do that can. Namely, the, this new priest will be able to make you perfect and to get you what you need to get to heaven, perfection, through what he does for you, apart from the law, although he, keep, he keeps the law. Okay, what further need would there have been in, for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would you say also that the nature of the Levitical priesthood, you know, was the, the, uh, the sacrificing of animals, you know, and, and this had to be done over and over repetitively in the Akhapur, you know, the animal, but, but the blood of goats and, and sheep was not adequate for the perfection I think you're talking about. Yes. So the, mm -hmm. the whole priesthood was wrapped around that. Yeah. And so this other Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And that's going to come up in Hebrews 9, I believe. Um, it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats can, can forgive sins and take away sins. And so, yeah, so this priest is going to be so superior because, like you say, it's not the blood of bulls and goats, which was only a preview to put sin into the remembrance of the people year after year, which could never take away sins, but it was reminding them of a need for the shed of blood to forgive sins although it couldn't do it, it was just a preview, but it was pointing to a great priest who's going to come, whose blood is the blood of a perfect man, who then can save you and make you perfect through his blood. And this blood actually really does, think about this, make you perfect in God's sight, gives you the forgiveness of your sins, and gives you the free gift of righteousness through faith in his name. Free gift of righteousness accredited to you who are still sinners and we're still not perfect but it's credited to you who believe in Jesus Christ to be accounted as righteous for the sake of the one in whom you've believed Jesus Christ the great high priest Melchizedek and after the order of Melchizedek so awesome that's true there's a number of failings so the law uh, has great things in it but it has no power to save you either through its commands or through its blood it's sacrifices. Perfect. Good, good point. All right, for verse 12. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Everybody say, Amen. Thank you, God. Well, okay, just say it in your hearts, though. <laughs> because, because the law, if we were still under that, would condemn us 
For cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. If we were still under that, we'd be in big trouble. But when we get a new priest, guess what? We get a new law, a different law, a better law, a better covenant, superior with better promises. Namely, you have faith in Jesus Christ and you receive the forgiveness of your sins. Praise God freely. So there's the great thing we need to remember about this. When Christ is our priest and we have believed in him and we're in the new covenant, the law has become for us obsolete. We still use the law in certain ways, as we say in the Lutheran theology, but not to justify ourselves before God. And so there's a change. When there's a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily going to also be a change in the law. That's good word for us today when we are tempted to think we're still under the law. No, we got a new priest. Therefore, the, he, he brings a different covenant, a different law to us than the old one, which couldn't save us. For the one of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. The point here is great that Jesus is not a Levitical priest. Couldn't be so. Because he's not in the genealogy of Aaron. Right? He's in the genealogy of David. He's in the line of Judah. Remember the promise that, uh, that was given, Genesis 49, verse 10. Uh, um, the scepter shall not depart from the Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So the kingship would come from Judah. Kings will come from Judah, and that's why we get David from Judah. But also... We, are, we get a priest from the line of Judah, which was not predicted in the Old Testament. But this, this is just all proving, once again, Jesus is not of the Levitical priesthood. He's an entirely different kind of priest, of whom the Levitical priests only were a shadow. But he's the real deal. He's the real thing. And he's not according to the line of Levi, but of Judah. Therefore, he must be a different kind of priest. Okay, verse 15. Any questions? This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not according to a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So, so Jesus is that other priest who has arisen, He's in the likeness of Melchizedek. And remember, Melchizedek resembled the Son of God. We read earlier in this chapter. So Jesus is the greater Melchizedek, who has become a priest. Jesus is a priest. Not only a king, but a priest. Prophet, priest, and king, right? Not according to a legal requirement, because he was descended from Levi. Uh, bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. So how did Jesus become a priest? Because he, the life in him is indestructible. He is eternal life. This is eternal life, that they know thee, the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, First John chapter 5. And the previous one was John chapter 17. So Jesus is eternal life. Amen? Amen. By his indestructible, invincible, eternal, forever conquering life that he has that is for eternal life by that he's become a high priest great so Melchizedek resembled that and as a type Christ is the real deal so this is really good news for you because you got such a priest now I mean we're going to look I mean people that are descended from Levi they're sinners the one who has an indestructible life is sinless he's perfect the other ones are mortals. They pass away. They're only here for a while. Jesus is here perpetually, eternally, and never leaves. Uh, they have uh, sacrifices that can't save you. He has one that eternally saves you. Eternal redemption. In the anchor in heaven, secure for your faith. And life in his blood. Yeah, the life is in the blood. Yeah, and Jesus gives his life for the life of the world. 
his flesh for the life of the world, and he says, drink my blood or you have no life in you. Drink my blood, and you live in me, and I in you, and I abide in you, and you abide in me, and you have eternal life, and I'll raise you up at the last day. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Good. He has life is in his blood. All right. For it is witnessed of him. And now we're going to get the... We're going to get where this promise came from. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what is he quoting there? Psalm 110. Where are we? Which chapter? Okay. Yeah, let's read this. Well, no. Uh, we'll go on a slight. No, let's read this. Let's read Psalm 110 here and see what it actually says in the promise. I have it here. You can look it up in your Bible too. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. How do we know that this is a messianic psalm, a song about the Christ? Well, because it's going to say it. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going with it. Because Hebrew says it. Uh, this actually ca calls this guy God, but also... Jeannie's hit it on the head. Jesus quotes this verse and says, uh, David said, is it David? The, the Lord said to my Lord, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, tell him to make your enemies your footstool. David then calls him Lord, so how is he then his son? Remember, Jesus says that? And they couldn't, you know, didn't dare ask him any more questions. <laughs> I love that. It's like, okay. <laughs> There is no beating the word of God at a match with words, or any match, actually. So they shut up and sat down and no more talking. But notice, Jesus refers this psalm to himself. Therefore, this psalm is about Christ according to Christ himself. So that's a good word. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day you lead your host upon the mountain, the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's the promise. And notice, it came with an oath, as we'll look at. He swore, God swore, namely gave an oath based on upon his own name and character. If this be not true, then I am false. But he swore, this is the truth. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. All these pertain to Christ. Christ is the Savior. He is all mercy, all good, all love, all salvation, and all justice. If people reject him, he will not strike his foes twice. He will utter that he's going to sweep sinners from off the face of the earth. He'll fill the earth with corpses. Let's mark that well. In a world that doesn't want to talk about the, judge, the judgment and the wrath of God, Jesus will execute his wrath. Who is this coming up from is that Basra, etc., whatever, with, with crimson stained garments? It's the Lord. He's been trampling the wine press alone, you know, spilling the blood of peoples. And those slain by the Lord shall be many. And that's pretty interesting, isn't it? At the very end of Isaiah, I've been memorizing Isaiah lately. I don't know if I can do this off the top of my head, but the very end of Isaiah is, and they shall go forth and look on the dead bodies of the men that have rebelled against me, for their fire shall not be, their worms shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. End of Isaiah. After all these great promises, at the end of it, God is going to wipe out and wipe clean the earth of evil and get rid of all accursed things, including those who have rebelled against him. And the righteous will go forth and look on this and say, Hooray for our God, he's set the earth free, now it's eternal victory. And, and righteousness and peace. So, these are the days to repent. Today is the day of salvation for the world that will 
That is not right now taking any heed to follow him. He could come tonight, like a thief in the night, and, uh, and bring his uh, judgment with rigor and dispatch, as uh, Romans 9 says. And so, uh, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Hebrews chapter 2. Yeah, Hebrews 2, first verses. So, he's the, he's the priest, he's the judge, he's the king, he's the prophet, he's the everything for us, frankly. But he is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And by the way, he's not a priest that just wears robes and hangs out in a, in a stale building and whatever. Not to say this is a stale building, but I'm like, don't think, I mean, look at this. He will drink from the brook, by the way. He'll shatter kings on the day of his wrath. This is a priest who goes forth to war, who brings his salvation, who gives you his blood, who's there for you. He's a, he's a victor. He's a champion. He's a warrior. He's a friend. He's a brother. He is alive. He's in the fresh fields with you. I mean, this is an active, athletic, uh, uh, running, rushing champion that you're with. So get out of your mind the idea of priests where you see and just... They're just swinging these, uh, you know, incense things, and, and they, they're not really, you can't even relate to them. And this guy, Jesus, you can relate to him, he can relate to you, and he is, he is a real man's man. <laughs> He's a real fresh wind from, from God uh, pre, kind of priests. On the, other, on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the, other hope, a better, on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So think about that. Another great word about the, the commandment. What commandment? A former commandment. Which former commandment? The entire law. That is set aside. Say the word set aside. You can say those words. All right. So pick, impact, imagine something that has been a burden and a curse to you, even though the law is good, but it just kills you. It kills you, and you can't keep it, and it only produces fear in your heart. And you pick that up, the priest picks it up, and carries it out to the, if I may be so bold as to say, to the dumpster outside, and throws it in and says, we're done with that one. It's set aside. Why? Because it's weak and useless. Because of its weakness and uselessness. As great as the law is, what does it say here? For the law made nothing perfect. So don't think that you're under the law. As a Christian, even though we use the law and it does point in right ways and we can use it to uh, rebuke ourselves if we're following after sin or and there's a law written on us to go in the right way in a sense, to New Covenant, he writes the law in your hearts that you might go in the right way. But in terms of justifying yourself before God and saying this is the basis of my relationship with God and meriting uh, his favor by my good works, that you just pick up and throw in the dumpster and say that's not it at all. That's not my relationship with God anymore. I have, what does it say here? A better hope is introduced, let's say that one, better hope, come on, you can say it, better hope, a <laughs> better hope, is introduced, in other words, brought into view for you, set before you, uh, a better hope is intru introduced through which we draw near to God, and this one you can draw near to God by it, because it does make you perfect, it's Jesus Christ, His cross, His blood, His saving work on your behalf, faith in Him, you can come freely up to, the, up to the Father and God says, Welcome, my children. What shall I do for you today? Come sit on my lap. Lay your, lay your head here against my chest and my breast, my bosom, and tell me your, your heart's woes. Let's see what we can do for you today. You know? Because he's a good God and we draw near to God boldly through Jesus Christ, through his blood and by the Spirit. And it was not without an oath, verse 20. In other words, when God made or promised Jesus that he would make him a priest after the order of Melchizedek forever, God made an oath. He swore, didn't he? In other words, yeah, by himself. So, you know, God doesn't need to swear in the sense that if he speaks something, it's going to come to pass. I mean, 
but he does that for the benefit of all who are here. If he swears, this is what was already 100% sure is doubly 100% sure in your mind. If you've sworn, it's going to come to pass. There's no possible way in heaven or on earth it won't come to pass. It will. God will make sure it happens. And he, he swore he'd make him a priest. The, those who formerly became priests took their office without an oath. All right, they just got in there because of their lineage. But this one was addressed with an oath. Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, thou art a priest forever. This makes Jesus the surety of a better covenant. Oh, let's say that one now, better covenant. It's better. It's better, it's better. It's so much better. Surety is a pledge, a security of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Right? How many, oh, how many priests did we have in the Old Testament days in the days of the Levites or even just in the line of Aaron? A bunch. Yeah. All sinners. All sinners and they died. Yeah, they died because they were sinners. So they're imperfect themselves. And uh, they only live, you know, 20, 30 40, 80 years, maybe 100 if they're really old. And, uh, but they all had to leave their office. They didn't continue. They had to be replaced by the next generation. And uh, the point here is, but Jesus holds his priesthood permanently. I mean, continually, as in forever. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek into eternity this will be your office O oh, jesus my son you shall be a priest to my people you will be the go-between what does a priest do he offers gifts and sacrifice of sins he gives a go-between between god and man jesus is the perfect go-between the perfect forever relationship between the eternal perfect holy god who is perfect and cannot look on sin and sinners jesus is the go-between such that when jesus is between us and his blood is the connecting between us and we've believed on him and he's come into us then when God looks at us though he sees that we have sin he reckons us as righteous and we're acceptable in his sight so he's the perfect go-between between God and man forever that otherwise we could never get close to God ever there's never any way you can do it every other religion I'm gonna to try to get there by my good deeds got my merits by my good works You'll never do it. You can't get to the Holy God by your own righteousness, which is filthy rags. And even the angels, he charges with error. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay. That's in the book of Job. So, uh, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever, because he lives forever. Death no longer has dominion over him. He lives forever. He rose victorious and he will be forever at God's right hand. 25, verse 25, consequently, in other words, on account of this, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's great. <laughs> Amen. That's fantastic. Consequently, on account of this, because he lives forever, and God has sworn he will be priest forever, for all time, of all history, and even into eternity, but even especially now in this in time, he is able, he is capable, he has the power to, he is fully able to save. Who does he save? Those who draw near to God through him. So it's not that the people save themselves, Jesus is the one who saves them. Who does he save? Anybody who comes to me, I'll not cast out. And the great open door. We're living in the days of the open door. Ever since the apostles were here, it's been the days of the open door. That day, the door's going to shut, though, one day. And people begin to stand outside and knock and say, Now, Lord, open to us. No, nope, too late. I called you to repent. Today's the day of salvation. And you didn't keep your lamps lit. You weren't ready. And they won't go into the marriage feast. But right now, we're living in the, in the days of the open door. Come one, come all. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
Turn to be and be saved all the ends of the earth. I was thinking, Eugenie, that's one of your favorite lines. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Turn and live, and Ezekiel. God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Come, come one, come all, buy wine, milk, without money, without price. Come, come, eat freely. No, no, I got a wife. No, I got a yoke of oxen. No, I bought a field. No, 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 Jesus, another time. Oh, don't do that, because the king will get angry and swear that you'll never, never taste of his marriage banquet if you re reject him. And a lot of people are doing that these days. But uh, notice he can always, always save those who, are draw, who draw near to God through him. It's always through him. He's the only door, the only way. Not many ways, one way. But if you come through Jesus as the door, you'll go in and out and find pasture. You will be saved. He will intercede for you. His blood intercedes for you. And he's constantly speaking to the Father. Ah, these have believed on me. Yes, I see that, my son. They are yours. They are mine. We're all family. Come, enter in through Christ. You're welcome here, says the Father in love through Jesus Christ. So he's always making intercession for you. And that's cool too. He's, uh, he, does that not he does that not only when we come to faith once and get saved, but he's perpetually every day, right now, at the right hand of God, interceding on your behalf. And his spirit also is interceding on your behalf with sighs to deep for words. I mean, there's God up there, we down here. How do you get to him? Jesus Christ. And, and his blood, and then the Spirit also is, inter is working this. And there's this great go-between between God and man. He knows we're sinners. He knows we're faulty. He knows we're mortal. He still loves us. He's now reconciled us to himself. We're reckoned as righteous. And one day, he's going to finish the job and make you perfect in your act of righteousness, too. We're not there yet, right? We're reckoned as righteous, but we still have sinful things we wrestle with. We're weak. In the flesh, but one day he's going to finish the good work that he began in you. And what is that good work he's going to finish? He's going to make you perfect, like himself. Whoa! I'm looking forward to that because I don't like my sin. I don't like sinful thoughts flickering and flittering past my mind. And, and occasionally I'll indulge for a second. Ah, ah, ah. I hate this flesh, right? But we're going to be made perfect. Yeah, right now, he's always interceding for you. Let's see if you can finish the chapter. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those, like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered up himself. Indeed, the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So what kind of a priest do we have? Look at this. This is fitting for us. In other words, it was what we needed. That we should have this kind of a high priest. What kind of a high priest? That he's holy, unlike the Levitical priests were not. I mean, they're holy in a sense. They're set apart for the ministry, but they were sinners. This guy, Jesus Christ, is pure. He's blameless, namely without sin, without stain. He's pure righteousness. He's unstained. There's not a speck on his garments. Not a spot of unfaithfulness, uh, sin, things you can't trust in for human beings normal human beings. He's the one human being you can trust in. I mean, I do my best to be a good pastor. God help me. But I have stains in terms of my, I mean, I've been reckoned as righteous, but in terms of who I am, in terms of my act of righteousness, I have faults. I'm not perfect. I have things I wrestle with. I, you know, I, I'm here to help you, but this one, Jesus Christ, has not a spot. Pure, perfect goodness is he. And he's separated from sinners, even exalted above the heavens. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Above the heavens, of the heavens of the heavens. He's the highest place that could possibly be. And the higher you go, the more power there is. 
authority and can do everything because you're getting closer to God. And guess what? He's at the right hand of God. He's seated, seated with Christ, with God on his throne. <laughs> That's pretty great. This is your high priest, friends. I mean, he's really there right now. That's where Jesus is as well as here. But he's right there at the highest, highest, highest place you can ever get to. And that's where he's, his blood is pleading for you. That's where he's interceding for you tonight. That's where he's being a friend to you and helping you from. He has no need like, of, like those high priests. In other words, the earthly sinful men ones, like Aaron was in his line, to offer sacrifices daily. First for their own sins and for, then for those of the people. Jesus didn't need any offering for his own sins. He had none. He offered himself for your sins. That's a, good, that's a better thing. And these priests had to do it continually, and they never took it. Why'd they have to do it continually? Because it never worked to ultimately <laughs> remove your sins. But he did this once for all when he offered up himself. He only has to do it once. That's enough. Jesus offering his blood, his life, his atoning death on the cross once for all time and for all people. It need never be repeated. You don't have to do it day after day after day. Dun, 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 blood, blah, 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 blah. It's once and done because it's perfect. And Jesus, or sorry, I mean Luther said that Jesus' blood was so precious. Think of this, that even the single drop that fell from him at the Passion was enough to reconcile the entire world. It's so pure. But God shows his great love for you and that he not only pours out a single drop, but he sheds it lavishly for you. And his death atones for you to show that he just lavishes upon you his grace. This is how God, who created you, loves you. Just pouring like a barrel of blessing and grace, waterfalls of rainbows of his blood covering you to save you and say, you're mine, I love you. This is how great your salvation is. Isn't that great? Once for all, he offered up himself. Indeed, the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. Let's contrast that to this. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, for a better priest, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So contrast weakness of sinful mortals with your priest who is the son of God, who is forever a priest because the Father has sworn it and it's forever. And a, a son who's been made perfect forever, in other words, he's completed his goal. He is, he's, he's accomplished our salvation and uh, he's now able to save you forever and ever and ever and ever. So. If you're still thinking of going back to the law, we got more chapters for you, but boy, that should be enough, right? Don't ever go back to the law. Now, that's tempting for us because when we read a lot of the book, book of the Bible is written to people who are under the law. And when we read the Old Testament, sometimes we're like, Ooh, I'm in big trouble. Oh my goodness, God slammed them for this and I'm even worse than that. Oh my goodness, I must be in terrible shape. I, must, I better keep that law. And, and that's the temptation because we're reading the Bible and it's the Bible and it's the truth so maybe we're in as big trouble. But good, look, we, have, we are in a bit different epoch. We're in a different time. We're in a different era. We're in the era of a better superior covenant, Jesus Christ. The old one is weak, useless. It's been set aside. It's been put in the dumpster. It's obsolete, fading away, he's going to say. Right now we got the real deal, the forever covenant. It's that God loves you. He saved you in Jesus Christ. This is by grace. It's by what he did for you. You receive it as a free gift. And now once you're justified, now God says, now stand on your feet. I make you alive. Let's walk together now as father and son. I'll show you some good deeds. We'll walk in them. It'll be a great life. You'll enjoy me. I'll enjoy you. We'll be happy forever. And one day soon, I'll take you. You'll get to see my face. And then I'll give you a great kingdom. And I'll even set you on my throne with me. And we'll, we, we together, God, the creator, the eternal one, and you. Yeah, you. You'll sit up here with me. We'll rule it all together. How about that? Does that sound like a good plan to you? To pour out for you the immeasurable riches of my grace and kindness toward you in Christ Jesus forever and ever. That's what's in my mind. So be excited about it. Amen. <laughs>